back to Sledgehammer Horror, guys. I am Ken Sledge, and let's talk horror. Today, I am joined by somebody that 13-year-old me would be absolutely terrified to be talking to. I am here with the beautiful and amazing Lar Park Lincoln. How are you doing today? Thank you, Ken. That was, that was so sweet. The 13-year-old you. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> This is so cool for me. This is something I am very excited about. I'm a huge fan of yours. I've been a huge fan for a long time. Rocking the New Blood t-shirt right now. Um, for those of you that don't know, um, Laura was also in House 2, the second story. And those of you that know me know, House is my favorite movie of all time. So I seeing you love in that sequel, House. Yes, and seeing you in that sequel is so amazing. She is also the most badass final girl in Friday the 13th as Tina in The New Blood, and she'll be reprising that role in the upcoming Roseblood, the Friday the 13th fan film, which I am over the moon excited about. Is there anything you can tell us about Roseblood before that's not that's yes. not under wraps right now? Of course I can. I actually just got the latest draft of the script, so I will be crawling in and checking that out this weekend. Um, yes, it's going to, uh, as my, my part of the show will take place about 30 years after Tina um, disappeared or was taken away in that ambulance. Mm -hmm. So we're going to see what has actually happened and what kind of a situation she ends up in while she's in the mental hospital. Oh, I'm so excited to see. It's something that that's the one that we've all wanted to see the sequel to. We all, you know, between that and obviously trying to find out what happened to Tommy, you know, those are the two things that you always wanted to know the most about, because that's one thing the Friday the 13th franchise is always a little inconsistent about, was updating yes. us on what happened to their characters afterwards. Yes. They like to uh -huh. start a brand new story. So I respect it, but it is going to be nice. You know, we've seen what happened to Tommy Jarvis in some of the offshoot fan films. Right. But now to see what happens to Tina, you know. The well, most it's really cool because uh, John Beekler and I had talked many times about continuing Tina. And it was just really important to me that uh, that her story continued with the, in, the integrity of what she went through, which is why I didn't do a part eight because at the time they wouldn't let me read part eight before I agreed to shoot it. And I didn't want uh, her character to just be killed off right away. She was just too interesting to me. So gosh, you know, this is a case of having a lot of patience and waiting 30 years <laughs> to finish telling the story. Um, I know that John would love the direction that we're going with it. So I'll just kind of be able to dedicate this to him a little bit, I think. That's awesome. That's super sweet of you to say something like that. Cause I know that he, it would mean a lot to him as well. Mm -hmm. And Something that I've always been a big fan of about Tina, especially a lot of the times, you know, our final girls in the Friday, the 13th night around Elm Street, Halloween, they've always been badasses, you know, but Tina, she took the fight to Jason. You know, she didn't, yeah. you know, yeah. you know, she, she was like, you know, it's, I'm going to hit, I'm going to headbutt you with a decapitated head. Like that's how right. badass <laughs> Tina was. Good point. Yeah. You know, she, she really did. She herself wasn't, uh, you know, she was really a vulnerable kind of character, which uh, John and I really wanted to come across that Tina had kind of just fallen into this, you know, she had these things happen in her life she couldn't understand. And she was, you know, trying to get someone to listen to her between her mother who was trying and then the, the horrible Dr. Cruz that was trying and, oh and, and then the other teenagers didn't, didn't want to help her except Nick was concerned. So she was she was uh, very much dealing with a, a feeling of being alone and trying to be understood and then realized she had to go after this monster, whether mm -hmm. or not he was in her mind or real. And, and of course she discovered that he was real. So I right. always liked that part of the story. Me too. And something you just brought up, I think the third most hated person besides Jason <laughs> and besides Roy Burns would be Dr. Cruz. Cruz I think Dr. Yeah. Cruz is the third on that list. That guy was despicable. Oh. <laughs> And such a fabulous man, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, he will be um, making an appearance in Roseblood. Ooh. Yes. Yes. The actual um, the actual actor, Terry, will be making an appearance. So uh, that's going to be super fun. I just adore Terry. He's an amazing actor. He's so much fun. He's mm -hmm. really grounded and super cool. So, And who knows who else might make an appearance? Right. Now I'm even more excited. I, 
Uh, Peter Anthony's a great guy, and he's somebody that I hold a lot of respect for, a lot of love for. And when he told me his idea of Rose Blood and that you guys were all going to be working on this, I thought my head was going to explode on the spot. Like, I'm so excited to see the possibilities of where this can go. And it shows the depth of acting that you said Terry has because mm -hmm. such a great man can play such a despicable character <laughs> that you just want to wring his neck every time he comes on screen. But the high praise you have for him shows how well he is committed to his craft that he can make you feel that way about him. Oh, he, he's, he's fabulous, you know, and I've, I've often said throughout all the years I've been acting, because I usually play there's someone who's a little mentally off or a prostitute or a <laughs> drug addict, you know, it's like, no, we're acting, I'm acting, just kidding, not really, or a bitch, you know, not <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 Pretty, I, I don't think I'm too much that in real, in real life, so. From every conversation I've had with you, you are an angel. I can say that with all my heart. Uh, before we get into the reason why you're here, something else I wanted to bring up, a little known fact. You not only are a part of the Friday the 13th universe, you are also a part of the Nightmare on Elm Street universe yes. from being in the Freddy show. Um, yes. What was that like? Freddy's dreams. Fre Freddy's dreams, Freddy's right? Freddy's nightmares. <laughs> Freddy's nightmares. That's what it yes, was. Yes, Freddy's nightmares. I got to tell you that that little show was one of my most favorite roles Ever. I, I got that after doing Friday 13th and the director, Tom, um, Tommy, uh, had directed part six of Friday okay. 13th and and called and asked me to do that one. And I was over the moon because it was a really special series. The way they had originally uh, the original concept of it was to do a one hour show that was complete but that each 30 minute segments of that one hour could stand alone as its own little story. Sure. So the first half of the show kind of centered around uh, the beefy burgers boy. I think that was the name of it. And then the second half of the show centered around what was happening with the girl in it. And then they, they came together so seamlessly. So for me, it was my twilight zone, you know? Yeah. <laughs> If I can't be in, in uh, Psycho, I'll be in a Twilight Zone. And it was so go. much fun shooting it. It was it was really cool. One of the scenes um, where, they're, where the character is having her head operated on in her nightmare. And <laughs> they had to mount the entire camera setup on top of me to shoot down. And they had glued my mouth shut with the fake stitches. And that was really kind of scary. It was like I bet. You know, cameraman and all that equipment above you and not being able to actually open my mouth. I've often joked, the worst thing you could do to an actor is sew their mouth shut <laughs> and we can't, you know, talk right. back. So well, then you got that feeling of claustrophobia too, with yeah. your mouth being taped shut, and you got this thing right on top of you. That's got to be a scary yeah. feeling, no matter what you're doing. It really was, and and I remember the uh, the makeup artist at the time actually saying, "You know, Lar, um, don't have a panic attack or any anxiety because if you throw up, you might, you know, choke." Oh. I'm like, oh my hear. gosh. So, and, and the camera crew set up only weighs, you know, a thousand pounds. So uh, well, we should have fallen you. So in your mind, you're going through all of these thoughts as you're trying to do the scene. But worst case scenarios every time. Yes, of course, of course. And and Tommy always had also uh, had his wife, Nancy G. McLaughlin, made appearances in the different shows. And and that's where I met her. And she became a, a good friend after that point. Mm -hmm. So good memories there. Oh, yeah. See, so this is why this is so amazing to me, because three of the big things I grew up with, Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, and House, you're a part of all those universes. And House was my first horror movie. That's why this movie is so important to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, and obviously growing up with Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, you know, this is huge for me. So before we really get started, from the bottom of my heart, Lars, thank you so much for coming on. This is a dream come true for me. It means the world. My pleasure. It's always fun to, to meet people that have loved what you've done. So Yes. Well, we, we talked about a little what you got going on in the future with Rose Blood and doing that right now. But I want to take it back to the past past. And I want to talk about what got you started in the horror genre. The first horror movie you watched and your first horror movie was? Well, it was uh, Karen Black and Trilogy of Terror. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for those of you that don't know, Trilogy of Terror was an anthology film mm -hmm. um, just about over an hour long. Right. Uh, you can find it on YouTube, actually, uh, if you would right. like to watch it. 
And the three segments are all Karen Black. Um, you have the first one, which is Julie, where she's this teacher that has a fling with a student. And then you got Millicent and Therese, which is, I'm not going to talk much about that one because it does have a very good twist to that one. Yeah. Now, Amelia, the last one, Amelia. the Zuni doll in that, when me and you started talking, I was like, I don't think I've ever seen this. And I'm watching it and I'm like, I don't think I've ever watched this. And then so we get to the Amelia. It. When I got to the Amelia one, I was like, I have seen this. And I've always wondered where I had seen that doll from. And so talking to you got brought me back to being able to, this is where I've seen this doll. Because I knew I had seen, the minute I seen that doll, I was like, oh my gosh, I know this. I know what this is. <laughs> it totally clicked so with me. good. I mean, it literally hits, um, you know, it literally hits all of the scary things that are yeah. still done in films today, right? It, it hits all of those. It's got the person alone mm -hmm. in their apartment or their house. It's It's got the phone call to someone which causes a problem. You know, she calls her mother and that's an issue. Yeah. It's got, you know, the, the piece where she's speaking to the boyfriend on the phone and having to cancel a date with him. So we know he's not going to show up to save her in a little yeah. bit. And she draws the bath, of course. So she's going to get even more vulnerable and, and be in, in there. And, and it just deals with that, that unknown that there's something under your bed also yes. or under the couch. Or it's just got all of those elements and the good thing about all three of these in the anthology, mm -hmm. I know I said I wasn't going to talk much about Millicent and Therese because it has that twist, but really all three of these have a good twist to yeah. the end of them. Yeah. Um, she, yeah. And you know, it was, it wasn't even to where like five or, I mean, I feel like it's only like a, I don't know what, a 15 minute piece or less because they were, you know, done in the regular mm -hmm. uh, network, you know, where you had an amount of time, the commercials in the middle. It, so it wasn't that long, but it goes to show you so much how storytelling doesn't yeah. matter when storytelling happens. If, if you stay true to a story itself, because it just brings us in and, and it, it keeps us engaged and it tells so much of a story in just a few minutes. Yes. You don't need and two hours. Right. right. And that's what I love about this. There's no filler. This is all right, right, right to the right. point. This is what's happening. So I guess I should say before we get started on this, because I enjoyed this very much. I have the link down here in the description as well as Lars links. Make sure you're following her. But I have the link to this movie down here in the description. If you haven't seen it, check it out before we talk about it, because there are going to be some spoilery bits we're going to talk mm -hmm. about. And I think you should experience the twist endings of these for yourself. Don't let us ruin these for you, because that is so much fun. And it's not very long for fans of Tales from the Hood, Tales from the Crypt, right. Creep Show. If you like those, you're going to like this. So click and this link down here and then come back and finish this interview. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Y'all y'all do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's um, mostly I've heard people say how they, they thought it was named wrong because they're calling it Amelia when when pretty much I mean, Trilogy of Terror really just means the one episode of the Amelia. And if they had named that doll something that would have been oh, yeah. you know, we, that little creepy doll. And, you know, it came back again. Chucky was a little doll. Anytime some inanimate <laughs> object. Oh, here's a funny one for you. You know, uh, you might not even remember, but years ago, there used to be a commercial for Snuggle Fabric Softener. And this little bear was a um, an animated bear and he'd pop up out of the laundry basket. And it was silly. And I'd look at that commercial and go, ooh, that could be a little creepy thing, just like that doll. <laughs> it stays in your mind. Yeah, you're talking about the little Snuggle Bear? The little- Yes, uh, yeah, they had yes. a couple of on this commercial but it was effective and yeah. uh if he had had little teeth and a crazy sword he would have been that little doll <laughs> chasing <laughs> some woman through her day she's doing that. right you need to switch your detergent <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> okay so when you think about um the trilogy of terror what's the first thing that pops into your head well the work of karen black absolutely and and her really disturbing eyes um, yes, you know, she is the main character in all three of these. Yes. She plays different characters, but right. she is amazing in this. And she's the only actor in the, the story of Amelia, which is yeah. also another reason why I love it so much. As you know, I own an acting studio, mm -hmm. so I'm always looking for things to, to work with and teach my, my actors. And one time, years ago, I actually used the Amelia story to teach a horror acting class. 
um, because because of all of the elements that it has in it, it really, they're the same elements that are used in horror throughout every decade. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, what I would do sometimes is play it for them and then I'd pause it and say, what's about to happen? And okay. uh, if, you, if you, as an actor and you're looking at your set and you're looking at all the things you're gonna do, what elements do you have to work with within whatever the set decorator has done and what can you use? Because sometimes those aren't, written into your actual actions. And it takes a good actor to find those pieces. Um, one of the things that happens to her character is there's an ottoman or a footstool that sticks out a little bit. And I pause right there and I say, what's about to happen? And someday right. she's gonna run into it, trip and fall, and they needed to have something for her to fall over and she's gonna crawl and she's you know gonna do these different things. So it just had, you know, and when the little shadow of the little creature's running around and she turns around and thinks she sees it, she does what um, a good horror movie has, which is you lean into the fear and she goes looking for whatever creature she saw run by and she doesn't even have right. a cat or anything. So I don't know, would you go look after the creature, something you saw or not? So it gives us that, oh, don't do that feeling <laughs> every time you watch it. And uh, you know, usually when people are talking about actors with great eyes, honestly, they're usually doing a light blue or a green eye because those photograph really well. And dark eyes on camera tend to photograph very shark like. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it, and so it's harder to light them. And her eyes were were small and they were close together and they were so intense so I, I loved that they used an actress with, with just that look and the way she's looking around, you can see her, her torment and her frustration and the, the fear in those, her eyes are very sinister looking mm -hmm. in, in, in most of her roles. It was, that was a look that she had that was so it's interesting. So as soon as I think Trilogy of Terror, I'm going Karen Black. I also actually think of another actress who is not the same, but to me is similar and that was Meg Foster who has okay. um, those very intense eyes. And I've gotten to meet her on a few conventions, which has been amazing. And she played some really interesting characters um, also. You know, the eyes, we, we always want to look at the eyes. So right. that's what I think of. That's so cool to me to hear you talk about how you got to meet this person and how excited you were to meet them. Like it shows that like you feel, we, we, look, we always put you guys up on a pedestal because of how amazing you guys are. But it's so good to hear these stories about how you get nervous and you get excited about meeting someone that's mean, that means the world to you as well. So that's so cool. Yeah, because, you know, we, we love what we're doing, too. So mm -hmm. it's it's so much fun to meet an actor that's playing a role that you've loved the show or the role or the actor, and you get to kind of meet them and visit with them a little bit. It's so much fun. I got to say, that's one of the reasons I think a lot of us love doing the fan conventions. And I don't know who to get to meet fans, which, you know, how often can someone say they're meeting fans of their work? That's amazing. Right. But we also get to meet our fellow actors and visit sure. them, you know, about different things. And, you know, and it's fun to meet actors that have done a role that you were up for and didn't get. Too. Ah. And you can really see, okay, yeah, I would have been wrong for this role. You were perfect. Da, da, da. Right. You know, that's, that's kind of fun too. At least you go into it with a positive attitude, not like, oh, this bitch. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Yeah, you know, in, in general, as actors, we're all just, you know, trying, trying to get our next role. You had asked how I ended up in horror, and um, it wasn't intentional. It was simply a, an audition that came through, like, like every other actor's audition. Um, it, it's not like we set out usually to find a specific genre. The genre can find us very often. And you just keep auditioning and auditioning over and over and over. And then, you know, if you're lucky, you book, you book some things. And if you're even luckier than that, they, they turn out to be something someone wants to watch, you know, right. which is not always easy because it takes such a huge team to put a project together. I sure. mean, it takes so many people. Um, I often tell my actors that, you know, when a show is great, a blockbuster or fabulous, we get all the credit, um, mm. you know, the actors do. When we didn't write it, produce it, direct it, score right. it, 
or advertise it. But then also, if a show really sucks, <laughs> we get all the blame <laughs> and we still didn't write it, direct it, produce it, score it. You know? <laughs> so that's one thing about being an actor. You've got to be pretty confident in your ability because mm -hmm. um, we're judged by things out of our control. Most sure. Of yeah. And that makes sense too, you know, because people don't, it's something I've talked about on this podcast before, something as what can seem as small as a score can make or break a movie. I mean, you oh. look at Halloween, you look at Jaws, people that have never seen these films, no, you know, everybody knows, da -dun, da -dun, you know, or you know the Halloween lick, you know, like these things, the score can be make or break on a film. And it takes everybody working together to make sure these things can be successful. You're absolutely right. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's such a huge amount of people um, that I, I think, you know, people might see a lot of that in the credits, but they may not really realize how much work and specialized work that each department does. You know, right. really, really, really specialized to make the whole thing come together. What always blows my mind is how the set directors and wardrobe people can read the same black and white scene I'm reading. And when I get there, they've created an entire look and feel to the project that I may not have thought of. I may think of it more now because I've been in the industry for so long. You know, there was a really good film with Michelle Pfeiffer. Um, it was called um, Tequila Sunrise. Yeah, okay. it was probably back in the 80s or early 90s. And the set direction on that, the way they did the lighting and the whole film would just blow your mind just to watch yeah. it. It's like, wow, you see why they get awards and so many things after the fact. It's, you know, the, the coloring, the wardrobe, the makeup coloring, the, the artist, um, the actor's coloring, all of it can really go together. And people that are doing small films or independent films or student films, I'm, I'm often telling them, you know, put some real thought into your elements your music and your your wardrobe and all because it will bring the whole show together it really yeah really will. Yeah. yeah like you said acting can only take you so far you, you've got to have the sets you got to have everything that goes along with it your score yeah. i mean how many times has the score alone built anxiety in a movie uh, built the suspense. <laughs> yeah you know like right? that's something that's so huge and yes actors have a huge part in it but you're right it's so nice to see you give, you're the quarterback giving the credit to your line right now. Oh, for sure. So and the thing it's is, really nice to hear. The, the probably to me, what one of the, the really most important jobs on a show is the editor. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, you know, I, they can make a rock look amazing just with the editing. And when they add in everything else, you see a scene without the editing and the music and, you know, there might not be anything to it, but you know, once they cut some music to your eyes or whatever you're doing, everybody's, you know, goes, it's, goes nuts. Is oh, that one of those I things have, where, um, do, I, do you ever watch your stuff back? Like, at, like say like Friday 7. Did you mm -hmm. ever like watch that back and just be like, wow. Like, so that's how that turned out after I had done it. Um, I don't know if I've thought of it that way. I, I might watch something once or twice to kind of, you know, see what it was. You know, I, I, there have been a lot of things I haven't even watched all the way through um, because to me, the joy for me as an, as an actor is doing, doing the work. Yeah. And then um, some things I just, I just love to see. I loved watching Knots Landing come together every week because, you know, you got your script weekly. You didn't know how it was going to turn out. There was a different director every week and um, you never knew if you were taking the character in a direction that would make sense when they wrote the next five episodes. So that was always <laughs> a challenge. But, um, you know, it's I, I just got to work on a show this January called Ghost Party. And okay. it's a family film about a, um, a re family reunion of ghosts. And we shot it all here in Dallas. And I, I was actually casting director on it also. And I was able to cast four of my own students in it. Oh, that's so cool. Including Major Dodson, who was on American Horror Story and Walking Dead. Yeah. And he plays the lead in this. He does a great job. And um, I forgot what I, I forgot where I was just going. I started thinking about major. Then I was talking about Ghost Party. Uh, <laughs> what was I thinking, Becca? Let me ask Becca. Did you know what I was thinking then? Uh, well, you were talking about that you that you started it, but you also helped with casting because you cast a few of your. Oh, I know what it was. Got it. So Becca can normally tell what I'm thinking. And even if it has nothing to do with that, it refreshed my mind. Thank but you, Becca. 
<laughs> yeah, he says, hey, Becca. Hi. <laughs> um, I don't know if you've ever met Becca on a convention with me or not, but she's also a very incredible actress and works in the crew unions too. Okay. Becca Rose. And uh, she's a scene stealer for sure. Um, I always tease her about that. But one of the things that was really fun on Ghost Party is we had to freeze for all of the special effects. So we would freeze, the director would talk us through them, and then we'd do the next piece of movement. And then we spent one day just shooting all of this green screen effect. And it was so much fun. So we walk through walls and we float and we go to heaven and all these things. I am really looking forward to seeing how they put that whole show together. Do we know what, what platform that's going to be on yet? Um, or? Yes, yes. It's due out uh, next October around Halloween. Um, it was a play that we shot as a film. So they used four and five cameras the whole time. And it's going to go into theaters and it will also probably go on streaming networks, I imagine. So awesome. yeah. I that mean, is that's Ghost really Party. Yes, Ghost Party. So much fun. Um, just a really, really well-written piece about, you know, this, this family of ghosts that has to meet and all of their personalities. So I had blue hair and I played the, the great auntie from many hundreds of years prior and <laughs> super fun. That's awesome. I know you said that's a family friendly show, but I love to support every guest I have. So any updates that you have, please let me know so I can feed that to people out here. And like I said, guys, you don't have to wait for me. Follow Lar down here and you'll be able to check it out yourself. So um, back to Trilogy of Horror real quick. We talked about what pops in your head, but I want to know which scene affected you the most from Trilogy of Horror? Well, you know, it was it was a very subtle little scene where in the very beginning and the doll has gone missing from her coffee table and she's looking for it. And it seems so strange because how did a doll just go missing from its box on her coffee table? Mm -hmm. And she puts her hand under the couch to see if she can find it. And she gets pricked by the little sword and she makes a comment, oh, you know, I guess I found you now. Ooh, that was a sharp little sword. And it kind of tells us, ooh, sharp little sword and he's, or an arrow. And you're kind of going, ooh, what, where is this gonna go? Yeah. You know, sticking your hand somewhere where you're not seeing it and you don't ex expect anything to happen. So I think that foretold the story. And, yeah. and then of course, when she's, um, when she's sitting in her bed and it's darting, you know, and it, well, really, you know, it's so many, it's when those also when the, the little thing is trying to get her and the blade is going under the door jam. Yeah. You know? um, because she's in this, I think she's just in the bathroom in that scene. And she's like, where do I go from here? You know, <laughs> is, is, is attacking me from under this door jam with a lot of venom and yeah. purpose you know, purpose. So a few of those scenes, um, they've always stayed with me even more than the fact, you know, when you see the image of the monster with the, the shark teeth, you know, really kind of like a piranha teeth, right? Yes. Like piranha. Those razor even that sharp. wasn't, yes, sharp little fangs all the way. Even that wasn't as scary to me as the, the, the knife coming under the door. It just seemed, yeah. you know, your mind was just filling in what was on the other side. Oh, yeah. Your imagination is always the best thing. That's why I've always been a bigger fan of, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Psycho. Yeah. It seems where they cut away and let your imagination take over yeah. for it. Um, so we talked about Trilogy of Horror. Now, I want to go off topic here a little bit. We know that was your first horror movie, Lar, but I want to go scream on you here for a second. What's your favorite scary movie? What is your favorite horror movie of all time? Well, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm a huge Psycho fan. And uh, I actually got to shoot in the real Psycho House at, on Universal Studios for a Murder, She Wrote episode. Oh. I got to shoot in the actual building. And, you know, that like made my life. That was amazing. <laughs> um, I don't know if Jaws is considered a horror movie, but I got to tell you, that one has never left my mind. It just, I literally remember climbing up on my seat in the theater. It was just, there you go, that little shark. Yes, exactly. Yeah. 
<laughs> oh, Jaws, absolutely a horror movie. I, I'm one of those people that, but I also consider Jurassic Park a horror movie because if I'm in that situation, I am terrified. And not only that, but I think Jaws, we were talking about the score and how much that movie means to people. I can't tell you how many times in my life I've said, smile, you son of a bitch. You know, like, <laughs> like that's something that's always been a lot to yeah. me too. Oh I remember very specifically, because I was really young. I wasn't even a teenager yet, I don't think, when it came out. Or maybe I was like 13. And I went with my dad. And he didn't really go to movies or anything much like that. And I remember just being paralyzed. Because, and, and you know, uh, one of my rules as an actor, for me personally, is I don't do films with water. Oh, I'm not going to float in dark water. I'm not going to dive in water. I'm not going to be under the sea with water coming in. Water, you can't fake water and fire very easily. And no, I do not want to have anything dangling in the water. I don't want to have that scariness. But I love swimming. I love the water in real life. But mm -mm, I do not want to do that. So I'll look through a script and I'm like, oh, it's a little creepy. There was a fun movie I watched called. Um, Okay, let me think about it just a second. It's on, uh, I was on a plane flying back from LA. This was just this last year. And it's about alligators. It's about a Florida, what's it called? Um, crawl. 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 What a good film they did with that. And I know that all the people on the plane got tired of me going, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm sure they did. But it was really creepy. They did a yeah. good job with the water rising and the... You know, they did good character development, too. I mean, you don't think you're going to like you hate the father and you start to understand him. And and I thought that the the girl that played the lead in that, I thought for sure she was a stunt woman. But when I looked her up, I didn't really see stunt credits. So that was a, a pretty impressive, creepy little show. Oh, yeah. I was a huge fan of Crawl. The bathroom scene alone, the anxiety in that bathroom scene that, was the so glass. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So good. Such a good film. Good I'm so I'm a creature feature guy. I love it. What like I said, Jaws, Jurassic Park, yeah. um, Crawl, I thought was amazing. I love the Tremors franchise. If it's a creature yeah. feature, I'm in. I'm gonna watch That's it. That's the thing, right? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> So we always end these, Laura, with the same question. I'm going to go back to Trilogy of Horror. Now, we're going to rank this on a skull count. Zero skulls being the worst, five being the best. However, we're not ranking this on a production. We're not being critics. We are ranking this on how this movie affected you and what it means to you today. So Trilogy of Horror, zero to five skulls, what would your ranking be? Oh, it would absolutely be five. It would be five. I loved watching it, it you know it lives up to its name of terror i loved watching it i loved that they were able to tell such a story in a very simple little set with one actress mm -hmm. just that of course i'm sure there were a million puppeteers running around crawling around on the floor but there were so many things about it i loved and i have found that audiences today and of all ages have a fun reaction to that movie and and that's to me, that's what movies should be. They should be fun and entertaining, even yeah. if they're sad or, or whatever. So, I, you know, when you asked me um, what, what my favorite show was, I, that was just the first thing that came into my mind because of all of its different elements, you know. Right. And they really hit the And when you're watching it, you, it's easy to forget. I compare this, not because of the style of film, but... I compare it to the It miniseries from 1991 because you can watch this and truly believe this is a film. This was a theatrical cut film. You right. don't watch this and go, oh, yeah, this was definitely made for TV. Like The Langoliers, for example. I love Stephen yeah. King's The Langoliers. But you watch that and you can feel that was made for TV. Right. With this, with uh, the 1991 It miniseries, you watch them back now and you're like, this, this could realistically have been a theatrical release film. Yeah. I mean, that's like looking at American Horror Story and, you uh -huh. know, and, and these things that are, you know, of course, they're massive budgets. You don't need a massive budget. I, I always like it when independent people are getting their projects made. I did a show called Expulsion that came out this last October, and it was a small budget project, but it was about science fiction, and it just had a really great job on a small budget. So I always tell people to never discount um, you know, the budget of a project, go with the, the talent that they're bringing in and the talent that, that have created it. Um, and, you know, spend your money on, on sound and editing <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Well, it's just like Host. That, that I don't know if you've seen it yet. Host on Shutter. Um, it's all I done through it. Zoom. It's all done through Zoom, and oh. it it's amazing. It's an hour long. It's not too long. It's another one of those movies with it's no filler, but yeah. it's already been called one of the top thirty scariest films of all time from okay, IGN. Okay, well, I'm gonna have to check that out because it's um, very good. Shooting on Zoom is really hard. When the pandemic hit, we were trying to think of ways to keep everyone engaged and what we could do as we started it. And so we did a funny little, um, we did a funny little take called Friday the Quarantine. And it was just a fun little show we did with all of our actors on Zoom. And I tell you, it was not easy to shoot because as you know, when you're, when you're looking at the camera on Zoom, they can't tell what you know if you're looking at a person the person watching it can't tell that so right. as we were shooting it and directing it it was just a silly little piece but it was hard to do i can't imagine doing the whole film on it so is that one film or a series one film okay host all right yep. it's on shutter that. you should check it out i think you would very much enjoy it it's very scary and the people that did it they've all been really good friends for a long time and i oh, feel like that really comes out in the film and you can tell these girls really care about each other by you know even though they're through zoom you can feel the love and terror they feel for each other oh i will definitely uh check that out absolutely thanks for the tip i'm no always problem. looking for the the next you know i loved the saw series oh I, yeah i thought that that was terrifying in a in a mental sort of way and kind of like you know you'll all get what you'll get what's coming to you and uh that mm -hmm. was a pretty terrifying series too oh yeah i, I really think you're going to enjoy host after you watch it all i ask please text me and let me know what you thought of it because i would i'm very interested to know what you think okay we'll do um don't go anywhere laura i got a couple more questions for you okay. everybody okay. else thank you so much for watching make sure you're clicking the links down here giving her a follow. She's got a lot of great stuff coming up. Like I said, Rose Blood alone is going to be so amazing. Seeing Tina 30 years in the future and how she's coping with everything. So as always, keep talking horror, stay what you are, and we'll see you guys soon.